Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video. This week I'm covering the self-proclaimed old man in a chair, Vernon Coleman. This is a guy who was suggested to me a while ago by several viewers, and I would consider him just a goofy old man in a chair who talks about crazy COVID conspiracies if his YouTube channel didn't have over 160,000 subscribers. And sure enough, he echoes a lot of the same stuff that swirls around COVID conspiracy circles. And the ideas he echo are definitely some of the goofy ones, but they're popular nonetheless. So without further ado, let's get into it. The people promoting vaccines never talk about risks at all. They admit that there might be some slight discomfort, a headache, a fever, and so on. But they don't talk about the big risks, the risk that a patient could be killed or severely brain damaged by a vaccination. No, we definitely do talk about serious adverse reactions to vaccines. Scientists and medical professionals are well aware that no medication that actually does anything is going to be 100% safe. But we don't just accept that these serious adverse reactions happen and say, tough luck. We are constantly trying to make vaccines better and safer. But while all that work is going on, the vaccines we already have are extremely safe. The reactions that Vernon is talking about here are exceedingly rare. And as I'll touch on later in the video, they're not always necessarily proven to be caused by the vaccine. Let's put aside the autism risk. Good thing he's putting it aside because there is no risk for autism from vaccines. This bodes well for the rest of the video, I'm sure. The figure of one in 10,000 for a future vaccine for the coronavirus was mentioned by Bill Gates in an interview in which he mentioned that if seven billion people were, as he planned, given a new coronavirus vaccine, then 700,000 people might be damaged. <sighs> Bill Gates is not a scientist. He is not a medical professional. Please listen to the scientists and medical professionals, not Bill Gates. A paper published in the Journal of the American Medical Association reported that seizures occur in about one in 640 children with one popular childhood vaccination. Which vaccine is he ta- you know what, fine, I'll just do it myself. It's not hard to find good data and research on this topic. Febrile seizures, which is what he's talking about here following vaccination, is a highly studied topic. And it has been consistently found that these febrile seizures have a very, very small increased risk of occurring after vaccination. However, febrile seizures are almost always harmless and have no long-term effects. They happen all the time without vaccines. So far, this seems like plain old fear-mongering from another anti-vaxxer who has no sources. And we're talking about the ultimate side effect, one that none of the pro-vaxxers ever likes to talk about. Death. If you think I'm making this up, and the pro-vaxxers will think just that, ask yourself why the American government has paid out over $4 billion as a result of vaccine injuries. Okay, here we go with the old vaccine courts argument. Yes, there is a specific court designed to compensate victims who have been damaged by vaccines. There's a very good reason that these courts exist. In the 70s and 80s, there were a wave of parents who were claiming that pertussis vaccines were causing brain damage to their children. These claims turned out to be absolutely false, but because science is decided in the laboratory and not the courtroom, courts awarded large sums of money to parents who claimed that their children were damaged by pertussis vaccines. So many were making these claims and such large payouts were being made that pharmaceutical companies decided to back out of producing the pertussis vaccine. Now, if the big bad evil world dominating government wanted you to just be sick and pay large sums of money to pharmaceutical industries by having to be hospitalized and use their drugs, then they would just let everyone get pertussis. But that's not what happened. That would be really bad if pertussis made a huge comeback. So the government decided to set up the special vaccine court where people can take their claims there instead of to pharmaceutical companies. This is where the whole myth of pharmaceutical companies having total legal immunity from vaccines comes from. Of course, Coleman will bring this up later, but I'll just address it now. Pharmaceutical companies do not have total legal immunity when it comes to vaccines. Yes, they cannot be sued by a random citizen who thinks that the vaccine damaged them or a member of their family. 
However, they can be sued for straight up negligence. So for example, if a pharmaceutical company knew that they were putting out a bad product and covered it up, or committed some other form of fraud surrounding a vaccine, they could absolutely be sued. So that's that. Now, when it comes to vaccine courts specifically and these big payouts that Vernon just brought up, well, they're not as concerning as you think. Like I said earlier, science is not decided in the courtroom. It's decided in laboratories and controlled studies. So if somebody wins in vaccine court, it doesn't necessarily mean that the vaccine actually caused their illness. It just means that the doctors couldn't prove a negative. They couldn't prove that the vaccine didn't cause their illness. But let's just take a second and use this vaccine court slash vaccine adverse event reporting system data to calculate how safe vaccines are. That is the risk that a vaccine dose is going to lead to a claimed reported injury. That is a pretty small number. And keep in mind that not all of those compensated claims were actually caused by a vaccine. In fact, there are several case studies where these compensations were shown to not have been caused by a vaccine. All this is to say that vaccines are incredibly safe, and the fact that there's a vaccine court that awards out large sums of money to the public every year doesn't mean that they're not. In America, the CDC states that the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System receives reports for only a small fraction of adverse events. No, the underreporting is referring to all adverse events, not just serious ones. And when we include all adverse events, we are including things like a sore arm. So no, not everybody who has a sore arm following vaccination is going to report it to theirs. Therefore, they say that is underreported. Doctors don't tend to report suspected side effects, however serious they are, usually because they're frightened of being sued. <sighs> Doctors are required to report adverse events to vaccines, to the VAERS database. And no, they're not afraid of getting sued because, like I just explained and how Vernon just mentioned, there's a specific court to deal with that. Oh my word, he's like a soundboard for a bad Facebook group. It is perhaps not surprising that Mr. Gates has insisted that the manufacturers of any new vaccine against the coronavirus be provided with legal immunity. <laughs> no, Bill Gates had nothing to do with the vaccine injury compensation program. That was the Congress under Ronald Reagan's administration. But yeah, I already debunked that one, so moving on. And there's another hazard. No one, as far as I've been able to find out, has ever done any research to find out how all these different vaccines interact in the human body. What do they do to the immune system? Your guess is as good as anyone else's. No long-term studies are done. No long-term safety tests are done. If they have been done, then they seem to have been kept secret, which seems unlikely. Kept a secret. Yeah, that's a good one. All those links are free to read and in the description below. I have, over the years, offered to debate the issue of vaccination with successive chief medical officers in the UK, live on national television. The offer has sadly always been met with silence. Yeah, I can understand a high-ranking scientist not having the time or patience to deal with any of Vernon's garbage, but I'm just an average scientist with some free time. So, Let's do it, Vernon. I'll talk to you anytime you want. Two final small points. First, I use thousands of books and scientific articles to prepare these short videos. They take every minute of the day. If I were to list all the references for each video, there'd only be one video a week at most. Oh my god. So, name one. He literally doesn't name a single source. He doesn't list one in the description of his videos, and he doesn't list one anywhere on his website. But luckily, I don't do that. I provide all of the links to all of the science that I talk about in this video in the description below so that you can read them for yourself. You know, I was joking about him being a soundboard for a bad Facebook group, but 
maybe that's his source. Maybe that's where he's getting all his information. Kind of makes sense. And that is going to do it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really do appreciate it. And if you like what I do, don't forget to subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.